and enter through that 11 network equipment. Remember, <clears throat> don't lose the big picture. A lot of times you get lost in the big picture. 802.11 is simply connecting users to the LAN via RF. Connecting users to the LAN via RF. The main reason why you have to put security on radio is because anyone who intercepts or can connect to your access point actually is connecting to your LAN. They don't need to bust down your apartment door. I don't need to crawl through Brianna's window. If I can get her access to her access point, I'm in her local area network. I can print to her printer. I can look at her computer from the network. I, I've accessed it. So it's very, very important. That's why RF security is so important. Let's look at the symbols. We've been talking about this. Access points use this symbol in network diagrams. It's very important that when you see that symbol, you know that is an access point because they won't always tell you that in, in the picture. So be aware of that. Be sure that you understand what symbol represents an access point. Access points work at layer one and layer two on CompTIA. The answer to the question will always be layer Two. So 802.11 802 is basically a layer two data link layer device, network device. I, again, I want to go back, and I said this before. If you'll notice, I am deliberately choosing graphics. I'm deliberately choosing a variety of different pictures representing what? OSI. The OSI. OSI. I deliberately went after ones that show you different information about each of the seven layers. So I highly encourage you to go look at this PowerPoint, get it, study it, because it really helps you kind of nail down network layer, what's there, uh, data link layer, what's there. All right, symbol for AP, we talked about that. And then, of course, this is the uh, OSI model, and we're going to find that access points are. SOHO home access points are really just a part of a multifunction device. They're really not separate. This is a this piece of equipment is very complex and it has lots. Technically, these devices are many logical network devices, but they do include most of you. I beat you to death with that comp, that concept. Now, the minute we go to business class APs, totally different. They don't have a router in them. They don't have a DHCP server in them. They don't have a firewall. They're simply a what? Access. That's it. That's all they do. So uh, business class APs are simply access points. That's all they are. And they're expensive. If you buy what we call a intelligent-less or what we call a thin access point, in other words, it doesn't have a lot of intelligence built into it, it's going to cut the cost a little bit. But if it has full intelligence inside the access point, it's going to run you between twelve and sixteen hundred dollars. So they're not cheap. They're designed to run twenty-four by seven. <clears throat> they usually have multiple radios. Excuse me, hold on here. They usually have multiple radios. So when you look at these access points, you're talking about a plastic box that has an N, a G, and maybe even an AC radio, all in one time. So they will have more than one radio inside, okay? The next concept that uh, CompTIA wants you to understand is content filters, and you guys are all experts at that, because we have a content filter here at Orange County Public Schools, and it's awful. Mm -hmm. It's killing me at my desk. There's a symbol. So if you're wondering what is a symbol of a content filter, that was the best picture I could find. Pretty lousy. Uh, remember, it's the use of a program to screen and exclude from access the availability of web pages or email that, see, that is deemed object, objectionable or violates company policies. Now, remember I, I told you I was trying to find companies for HIDS and it was really hard? Oh my goodness. If you want to find companies that sell content filters, it's like, it's like going to Publix. You have 4,000 companies that want to sell you content filter. So, if you want a content filter, every shape and size and price, it's out there. 
You can even buy a mommy daddy content filter for your little teenage daughter or your teenage son. So when it comes to a content filter, there was a ton of companies that sell uh, content filters. Most of them were pretty sophisticated. Here was one with a dashboard. I could see allowed websites. I could see time spent surfing. So I could see I could see websites blocked by users. I could see allowed websites by duration. Just all kinds of information. So <clears throat> a company could snoop on you real easy. And that's probably what they want this for, is just to keep track of those really. So here's some of the features. Let's take a look at them. Web surfing record here records all websites visited or blocked. Everything. Web searches. See what's being typed in and searched for on all search engines. Monitor network bandwidth user by computer. So we're looking at who's the top 10 surfers. Okay, and they start finding out statistics like Mike checks sports every morning for 15 minutes. Let's dock his pay. Um, utilize 36 pre-screened and assorted URL lists to implement policies. Block websites with keywords. We've already seen that. URL, URL whitelist and things of this nature. So this is just going to give you feature sets of content filters. Orange County Public Schools uses Bright House and it's off. I hate it. It's, the, it's just a very frustrating content filter and it drives us all nuts. Let's talk about load balancers. Load balancers are probably the most, the most, in most cases you can't buy a load balancer. Look up here. So this is an F5. F5 sells a load balancer. Notice it's a single appliance, probably a Looks like a 2U rack mounted appliance. And when I say appliance, what am I talking about? When I say appliance, I'm not talking about toaster or a blender or a juice grinder. What am I talking about, Otto? When I say appliance, what am I talking about? So in other words, here's what, here's what F5 does. They have a load balancer. Obviously, they have proprietary software in there, yes? But what they do is they create an appliance. It's got the hardware, it's got everything, it's got the software, it's got everything. All you got to do is rack it up, connect it up to your system, and it works. In other words, it's, it's everything all in one. You get the hardware, the software, everything. And they probably even come in and install it for you. So that would be considered an appliance. It, they sell everything. So you just buy the, the rack or the box, and inside is everything you need to have. So you can buy firewall appliances. You can buy, listen, DNS servers as appliance. And does anyone know what a typical enterprise DNS server runs? Does anyone have any idea? How about, about $35,000? Ouch. Yeah. Go, go price them. Uh, so this is an F5. Now look. Here's an interesting definition of a load balancer. A load balancer is a device that acts as a reverse proxy. Distributes network or application traffic across a number of servers. Load balancers are used to increase capacity, how many concurrent users at a time, and the reliability of the application. So that is the purpose all right, here we go. Load balancers are, listen, this is simple. Load balancers are simply software between thousands of users and a limited amount of web servers, DNS servers, database servers, application servers. I want you to look at that list. Anyone know what VDI servers are? What is VDI? You guys need to know that. VDI, virtual desktops. Okay, so if I put a bunch of virtual desktops on these servers and you're accessing them as users, the load balancer can send you to a desktop that, or a server that is not over capacity. It can, it can do VPN, it can do file server, mail servers, application servers, database. Here's an example for uh, this particular company. This particular setup allowed over a million 
concurrent HTTP connections with this present setup. So they had four load balancers, a NAT device, and a huge data center, and they could handle over a million HTTP current, current, wow. concurrent connections. That's pretty serious load balancing. So the idea of a load balancer is lots of users, limited amount of whatever, web servers, DNS servers, whatever. Think of it. How many, how many servers are actually making up .NET, DNS server, the .com, the, the .org? Do you think it's one little bitty box somewhere in Oregon that sits there and does all the DNS servers for .org? Trust me, it's exactly what you see here. So to get to the .org DNS domain, you probably have a load balancer and racks and racks and racks and racks of DNS servers. Because how long does it take to resolve a .org? Microsecond. If you have 10,000 requests for that kind of stuff and you don't have a load balance system, it ain't going to happen. You're going to be waiting your turn, milliseconds. Okay, is there one there? So everybody uses load balancers. Everybody that's doing any kind of serious, anytime this is the condition, thousands of, Users. limited amount of, you're going to use load balancers. That's just bottom line. I don't care what it is. So let's take a look. Lots of load balance companies out there. Okay, here you can buy an appliance. Kemp has an appliance. All the software is built in, a piece of hardware. You rack it up and you go. Okay. Some of them uh, didn't want to talk about what they had. It was very hard to get the actual information. But let's go take a look at the big ones. Let's go look at the big guys. Okay. The camp is the small guys. Go, let's go look at the big guys. So, all major internet sites use some type of what? Everybody. If you've got a major site that's hosting a store, I do a lot of online shopping. So I'll go to lightbulbs.com because I need a specific light bulb. There are probably at any one time 10,000 people on that site. If they don't have load balancing, it ain't going to happen. You're going to be frustrated and moving on. So let me show you an example of some biggies. Here we go. There's a biggie. <clears throat> so remember, you think Amazon is a store, yes? It's not, guys. Amazon is the biggest hosting service in the world. Amazon is the biggest hosting service in the world. Do you know where Cisco curriculum is at? You know where your Cisco curriculum is at? Sir. Amazon Web Services. All kinds of sites are on Amazon's hosted services. And if you are, uh, if you're building a data, if you're using Amazon, you can actually build the logic of your own load balancer. So the developer on Amazon's web services, such as Cisco Academy, they can build their own load balancer, they can set up their database, their servers, and they can handle thousands of you guys, and they can have limited amount of servers. And so you think, wow, those, that website really responds well. I get my curriculum, I click, and it's right there. It's just fantastic. Well, they're using Amazon services. Is Amazon the only one? Well, of course not. Uh, another big one is Microsoft. Microsoft Azure. Microsoft Azure is the same thing. So Microsoft is will allow companies to come in, host mammoth websites, host mammoth stores. So you can go in and buy chunks of Azure, by servers, by databases, by um, however. And what's really, really cool is it's all, all of this stuff is dynamic. They call it elastic. Because guys have a problem. They're... Their waistline grows after the burrito buffet. And if they don't have elastic waistbands to stretch and give a little, <clears throat> isn't that right, Brianna? So, <laughs> so they call these elastic load balancers. So what happens if more users are coming? 
the load balancer will actually add capacity and put more servers online and the response is so you'll hear that word elastic a lot let's go take a look at the last one who, who knows what the last one is come on Amazon Microsoft come on what's the last one Google. Google. thank you all right who's another big one so another big cloud provider and of course look how to create HTTP load balancing for web servers Google has a whole developer system so they can do the same thing whether you're using Amazon Web Services if you're using any of the vendors if you will look all of them have the same feature now let me show you something while we're here let's go to our website I'm gonna to go to Cisco's website and I want you to look at the log on I want you to watch the URL because you're gonna see AWS in it alright so I'm gonna go here to 901902. I want you to look at the, uh, it's kind of hiding it. Let me see. There it is. Everyone see it? See the Amazon Web Services? That's where your stuff is stored. Amazon Web Services. So all kinds of people are using these mammoth public hosting sites to host all kinds of stuff. Here, your curriculum is hosted on Amazon Web Services. How can 3,600 schools with who knows how many students and those can access these web pages at the same time? How could they do that? Low balance. Low balance. I mean, 10,000 students accessing the same page, it would, it would require immense amount of So you could do this on Azure, you could do it on Google site, you can do it on Amazon. Why is Cisco there? Probably because they're cheaper. <laughs> It's all about price, guys. Sorry. So, does everyone got it? Load balancing makes all websites work. In fact, you can always tell when you're at a site that's poorly designed because it's what? Slow. It's like we're just totally intolerant to a slow website. When I click something, I want it to happen. So, without this kind of technology, it's not.